Good afternoon, Year 6, and welcome to your second science lesson for our topic of evolution. So today we're moving on to variation, and I've put you six pictures on my screen to have a look at to see if you can already be thinking of what you think variation might be. So last lesson, we were having a look at how animals have adapted over time to survive in their habitats. So some of their ad adaptations might be that they ended up being taller or shorter. They might have adapted so that they had differences in colours, and we know that that could be to do with camouflage. They might have defences to protect themselves, so that could be to do with having sharper beaks, teeth or claws. But those things also might be adaptations to help them um, get the food that they need. So the adaptations and characteristics um, that they have have helped them to survive and then they pass them on to their offspring. So we're going to watch a video um, that gives you an example of this in moths. So the moth that we're going to have a look at um, is sometimes this sort of speckled colour or mottled colour and other times it's black depending on what adaptation it needs in order to survive. Hopefully by now, you realize that our world is always changing. Landforms change, weather changes, even molecules change. With all of that change going on, living things had better be able to keep up. And they do. When the world around them changes, living things change too, sometimes in a big way. So what can happen to living things when the world around them changes? You may recall that once upon a time we talked about pineapples and we said they were picky because they could only grow in lovely, lush, tropical climates. No pineapples at the poles, right? That's because the environment in the tropics is perfect for growing pineapples. An environment is made up of the conditions around a living thing. Now that might sound kind of like the definition of the word ecosystem, but the word environment is usually used to talk just about non-living things in an ecosystem, like temperature or the amount of rain or even how much pollution there is. So while the environment at the poles isn't great for growing pineapples, it suits other living things just fine. Like penguins in Antarctica and polar bears at the North Pole. If we put these animals into a pineapple field, they'd get pretty hot and unhappy. That's because they have adaptations for the cold. An adaptation is a characteristic that helps an organism live in its environment. But sometimes when an environment changes, it upsets the delicate balance of the food chains in an ecosystem. For example, about 360 million years ago, the Earth looked a lot different different than it does now. The earth was much warmer and the land was covered with lots of forests and swamps. And the animals that lived then? Let's talk about centipedes that were two meters long, amphibians that were six meters long, and dragonflies that were the size of large birds. Clearly none of these creatures are still around. So what happened? The environment changed. Over several million years, the climate became drier and cooler, and many plants didn't have adaptations that helped them to survive in this new, cool, dry environment. So they became extinct. And that was a problem. Plants are at the bottom of the food chain. They make chemical energy through photosynthesis and they release oxygen. All of those plants made lots and lots of oxygen. There was more oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere then than there is now, enough to support all of those giant insects. But when the plants became extinct, the animals that depended on all of that oxygen could no longer survive. Ciao, giant insects. And the amphibians and other animals that ate those insects had less food, so they didn't do much better. See ya, giant amphibians. But let's take a look at how adaptations can help a living thing fit into its environment using another smaller insect. Hmm. Meet the peppered moth. Cute, right? And it comes in two types, light and dark. As you can probably tell, the dark colored moths are a lot easier to see when they're resting on trees, and easier to see means more likely to become snacks for birds and other predators. That means the light moths have an adaptation that helps them live in their environment. So if we went through the woods looking for moths, we would expect to catch more dark moths than light ones. Now, what would happen if the environment changed? It did. 
True story. A couple hundred years ago, people started burning a lot of coal for fuel, and this made a lot of pollution. The pollution coated the trees, turning them dark with soot and dirt. The dark moths now had the adaptation that helped them fit into the environment. They blended in with the trees, which were now dark too. The moths that were lighter, though, not so lucky. In the polluted environment, they couldn't blend in as well, so they got eaten more often than the dark moths. The dark moths that lived reproduced to make more dark moths. The results? After the environment had been polluted for a long time, there were more dark moths than light ones. Fortunately, we've gotten to be a lot smarter about pollution. Over the last 50 years, the environment has changed from more polluted to less polluted, and the trees aren't covered with dark dirt anymore. As you can see in this diagram, the number of light-colored moths is on the rise. All living things have characteristics that help them to fit into their environment called adaptations. If the environment, the conditions in which something lives, changes, then the living things change too. The living things might gain different adaptations that help them to survive in the new environment, or the result might be more severe and affect the whole food chain. But more on that next time. So, we know that animals continue to adapt to help them survive. And that can happen um, over a period of years or depending on whether the environment changes again. In the last lesson, we looked at a similar example about horses and their adaptation, adaptations meant that they actually changed so much that a new species evolved. So on my timeline, I've got a reminder about how this happened. So we have got the first ever horses and they lived in an environment where there was lots of grass and that's what they grazed on and ate. But some of those horses had small teeth and it meant that they struggled to eat the grass and grind it down into smaller pieces. And they actually went hungry and they weren't ever able to survive very long. So they started to adapt to have bigger teeth. So we'd got a mixture of horses, some with big te bigger teeth and some with these small ones. The ones with the bigger ones were able to chew the grass so they had lots of food and they were able to survive. And that meant that they lived longer. So we've moved on to the fourth part and they had more offspring or children, which also had larger teeth because they pass on the characteristic that helped them to survive because that's useful for them to have. But over time, more and more of these animals were being born that had larger teeth and less and less of the ones that had small teeth were being born. So it ended up where they changed that much from where, what they'd started as, that they became a new species and they're more like horses that we know today. So eventually, after all of these adaptations, if it continues and continues and continues to be passed on, it evolves so much that it becomes a new species. So I've got a different example for you here because we said last week that lots of dogs, so wild dogs and domestic dogs that we have as pets, all come from a common ancestor. So they all come from the grey wolf. That's their ancestor that we started off as um, for the dogs. But some of these dogs lived in different places. Some were in Europe, some were in North America, some in China and some in India. And those places will have very different environments at different times of the year as well. So these um, dogs needed to adapt. They might be wild dogs that need to adapt. So they've got um, things like hunting prey that they need to adapt for, but they've also got the environment that they're actually living in that they need to survive, um, adapt for. And then we've got domestic dogs that change as well. And they adapted so much from this grey wolf that they became new species. So you can see lots of options um, of different types of dogs that we've got there in the one below. So the second row, there are lots of different species of dogs that all came from this common ancestor. So at the bottom of my page, it says all dogs share a common ancestor and they adapted and evolved to create a species of wild dogs. We've got domestic dogs. There's lots of different types. So we know that species evolve due to adaptations from the ancestors that they share. But are there still differences? between animals of the same species. So are they, even now, when they've created a new species, are there still differences within them? That's what we're gonna have a look at today. So if we go back, this gray wolf 
was the common ancestor and it adapted over time to suit its environment. So whether it was Europe or North America, or China or India. And it adapted that much that it actually became a new species because it became really different from what it started as. But if we have a look at one of these species, so if we have a look at this one, it's quite a tall dog. That dog or the species can actually vary as well. So sometimes we have a really small dog and another time we have an, a really tall dog. Sometimes they have more fur. If we have a look at a different species that evolved from the wolf, they differ as well. This one has got a curly tail and it's got white fur. This one's got a straighter tail and it's got brown fur and it's also slightly smaller. And that happens for every different species, whether it's a plant or an animal. So based on that, what do we think variation means? Because that's what we're going to have a look at today. So what does variation mean? You might want to use some of these pictures and pause the video to see if you can come up with an idea for that already because we're going to come to an answer later on in the lesson. So use the pictures to help you. What do you think variation is? You've got domestic dogs, domestic cats, tigers, which is a species, but they're all different, and human eyes. So see if you can figure out what variation means. So variation is the differences between individuals within a species, and they can be caused by the environment, which is something we've looked at already, or genetics. So let's have a look at one example first. The domestic dog. All of these are domestic dogs, so a species of dog, but they are not all the same. So how do the animals in this species vary? Pause the video, see how many different variations that you can come up with for these dogs. So some that I spotted that you might have seen as well is um, their height is quite an obvious one to start with. All of these dogs are different heights. They have different fur. So it could be the length of their fur. It might be the color of their fur. It might be whether it's slightly curly. It could be straight fur. It could be short, long. What else is different about them? Well, I've noticed that their ear shape and size is different. They might have different length claws. They might have different length teeth. That's something that we've looked at already. So even though this is the same species, there are lots of differences between them. Some of them have spots, some of them have patches, some of them are just one colour. What about domestic cats then? What differences or variations within this species can you spot? You might come up with some similar ones to what we've just talked about. So pause the video now, see how many you can come up with, and then we'll go through some answers. So well done if you've said that some of them have different coloured fur, but you might have spotted that some of them have fur and some of them are furless. So you might use the suffix less. This one second from the left doesn't have fur at all. It's just skin. If you're looking at this one and comparing it to others, you might also notice that it has different ear shapes and sizes. You might have noticed that their fur is different lengths and colours if they have fur. But actually, this furless one still has different patches of colour on it. You might have noticed that their eyes are different colours. Maybe they are different heights. There are lots of things that you could have noticed or spotted about these cats. So what about horses then? That's something different and we've looked at last lesson. How do the animals in this species, they're all horses, how do they vary though? What's different about them? So pause the video again, see what answers you can come up with. You might get some different ones. So fantastic. You might have spotted that there's something that's easier to see in this photo that the other two animals both have, but you can see it more clearly in this one and it's their tails. 
So you could say that they have different length tails, they are different colours, and often they're different colours to their bodies. You might want to say that they have different length manes, so the hair on their neck, which are also different colours as well. You could say that they have different markings. So some horses, if you have a look at this one, has a star on its um, forehead. Some of them don't have any markings at all. Others have markings on their legs, near their hooves. Some of them have markings that are more like patches or dots, and it could be on their hand, it could be in their middle or towards their neck. They are all different colours is another thing that you could have spotted. They are all different heights. So we've got some horses that look like Shetland ponies down here in the bottom left. Lots of different things that you can spot about this one. The next one, tigers, what is different about these? So pause the video, see if you can come up with your own ideas for this one. Well done. One of the things I like about this one is that often um, tigers are endangered and some of these on this photo you are very, very unlikely to see um, because of the numbers in the wild or even in captivity. But one of the things that is most notable, noticeable is their fur colour. So we don't often see tigers that are white, but that could be to do with their environment. It could be to do with genes that have been passed on. So until we look at it a little bit more, we're not entirely sure. It might have started as an adaptation for the environment and then because it was passed on through its genes, it's become something that's been inherited. You might also notice that they're different sizes. So the two on the outside are a lot bigger than the two in the middle, which might lead you to look at their paws, might lead you to look and think about teeth and claws. So. If we ever think about humans then, because we're a species of animal, what things can you notice that we might be um, might vary between us from the picture? Eye colour, well done. So we all have different coloured eyes. But what other things vary between humans? What things can you think of that are different between us? So, Try and make a list of things on a piece of paper or um, in a notebook, whatever you've got there. What, what variations are there within humans? So let's have a recap. What is variation again? So hopefully you've got your own definition. You might have been able to adapt it if you've seen mine from um, earlier on in the video, but it is the differences between the individuals within a species. So choose a species of animal, see what the differences are. Where do you think then these differences come from? Because we've talked about one of the reasons or one of the um, ways that we get variation and we've briefly mentioned another one. So last lesson, we looked at how animals adapt to their environment, which leads to um, variations. So one reason is environment. What other reason might there be? So is it always to do with adapting to our habitat, our environment? Or do we get variation in appearance from something else? So one of the ways that we might get um, our variation is um, quite evident in humans. So why might humans have different coloured eyes? Is it because of their environment? Do we have different coloured eyes if we live in a hot country or a cold country? Or is it because of something else? Where do our eye colour, where does it come from? Parents, well done. So our parents' genes can result in variation of their offspring. So that's the other reason. We've got environment as number one, and parents as um, number two. So it's, at, it's called inheritance. We inherit those characteristics that get passed on from our parents. So what about if we look at dogs then? Why might some domestic dogs have spots and others only have one colour fur? 
or why are some of them tall and some of them short? Why do these differences occur? Is it because of their environment? Do we only get short dogs in Europe, but we get really tall ones in North America? Do we get spotty dogs in the Arctic, but we get um, single coloured dogs in Africa? No, nope, it's because of their parents' genes again. So we are discussing variations within species today. So our success criteria has some gaps that we need to fill in and there are options at the bottom of my page that we need to try and um, use. So variation is a something between individuals within a species. Is it the environment, offspring or differences? Differences, well done. Variation is the differences between individuals within a species. Hopefully you've got that one because we've mentioned it a few times now. Variations can be inherited or occur due to the environment or offspring. They can be inherited or due to the environment. Fantastic. So let's check if we've got this last one right. Parents pass on characteristics to their offspring or children. It's the same thing. So let's have a look at how some variations are caused. What variations of eye colour do you think the children of these parents are going to have? So we've got a mum with blue eyes and we've got a dad with brown eyes. What colour do you think their children's eyes might be? So we're using a modal verb because it's might. We don't, it's indicating a possibility. We don't definitely know yet. So they could have brown eyes like their dad. What else could they have? Blue eyes, fantastic. So that's the options that they could end up with. They might have uh, one child and they only have it with brown eyes. They could end up with two children and one could have brown eyes and one could have blue eyes. They could end up with two brown eyed children or two blue eyed children, but they're the options for eye colour from these two parents. So let's have a look at dogs then, because we can apply this to any animal. So what variations of fur might these sheepdog or border collie puppies have? So we've got one parent who's black and white and one parent who's tricolour. She's three colours, brown, black and white. And I've given you some clues. Think about fur length and colour. So pause the video. You might want to draw the options you think you could have. You might want to write them down. But I will give you another clue. Both parents have long fur. So I think that all of the puppies are likely to have long fur because both parents do. So what colours did we come up with then? Well, I think that they could be like one of the parents, couldn't they? They might just have black and white fur. Could they be like one of the other parent? They could. So they could end up having tricoloured fur as well. But that tricolour fur could be the same as this parent, so mainly black with a little bit of brown. Or it could switch and they might have light brown fur with a little bit of the darker fur and it could switch around. So that should give you a clue for a different sort of puppy. We can have puppies that are just brown and white. We could also have puppies that are mainly black because two parents both have mainly black fur. Could end up where they're all black, it would be very, very unlikely, but you possibly could have them with or white fur or mostly white fur. So let's have a look at a different one because dog breeding is something that people do. They want to get certain characteristics if they want a particular um, job that their dog's going to do. It could be that they want a characteristic because they want their dog to look a certain way. So I've got a Dachshund or a sausage dog and a Dalmatian. And what do you think would happen if we crossed or if we were able to cross these two dogs? So I've given you three clues. We might end up with small puppies, like this dog. Could end up with medium puppies, because it's a cross between both. Or tall puppies, which is most like the Dalmatian. What colours do you think we could have? So pause it again, see what you can come up with. So I thought that maybe we could end up with a dog that is mostly brown and small like the Dachshund. But we might end up with one that's brown like the Dachshund but has the spots of the Dalmatian and it's still small. 
We could end up with a small dash and shape dog, sausage dog, that is exactly like the Dalmatian in its colour. Or we could end up with a complete mixture of both, which is quite rare. What about medium dogs? And this is quite hard to find. What about the medium one? You could have come up with different colour combinations for this one, but the one I got was that it could be brown and white, have a few spots in it and be a bit of a mixture. It's got long ears. Both its parents have quite long ears. It's just the shape of them are a bit different. And then what about tall puppies? What do you think we could have for tall puppies? So if it's tall, it's probably going to take mostly after this Dalmatian dog, was my thought process, but you might have thought differently. So I thought, well, it could end up just looking like a Dalmatian, like the one on the left. It might have taken on more of the um, colouring from the other dog and ended up with patches that are bigger to show that it's got some. And this one's also got quite big feet which is like Dachshund. So it could have taken characteristics from both parents. So variations can occur in any living thing. It doesn't have to be an animal, but we want to know whether they're from the environment or inherited characteristics. So for these tulips, type of flower, they're all different colors, but they're growing in the same field. So do we think it's the environment that's made them like this? Or do we think it's inherited? Do we think that it comes from the seeds that they grew from? I think it's inherited as well. Well done if you said that. What about the second one? We've got identical twin boys. Do you think that that comes from the environment they live in? The fact that they are identical? Or do you think it's something they've inherited from their parents? You're right if you've said it's inherited. They look the same because they share certain genes from their mum and dad. So as brothers and sisters, we often look very similar, but we might have certain differences because some of us might be more like our mums, some of us might, might be more like our dads. What about this one with the trees? This is a tricky one. So all of these trees are actually the same sort of tree. So they've inherited characteristics. What do we think about the colour? Why has that changed? We see this at different times of the year. So it's to do with the change in weather and the seasons, which means that it's in environmental. That's a bit of a trick one. What do we think about these two girls here? So these two are in identical twins. So their first characteristics that they've got, so when they were young, like these two boys, it will have been inherited as well. But why do they look different now? What have they changed? Their hair colour, they've chosen to dye their hair, which means that actually it's environmental. They wouldn't look like that if they hadn't chosen to change that themselves and used hair dye. And then this last one. These plants are all growing in the same field. They are a very similar size and the same colour. Do we think that it's inherited from seeds or do we think it's an environment or do we think it's both? So my answer to this one is that it's inherited from the same seeds. But I think you could argue that if they're getting the same water, the same nutrients, the same amount of sunlight, that maybe they're the same size and colour because of the environment. So I think you could have had both for that one, actually. I think that would be a good answer for this one, because sometimes characteristics, a bit like the, the identical twin girls as well, are to do with both. So we can use a Venn diagram to show that. And that's what you're going to do today as one of your tasks. So we've got inherited on one side and environment on the other and both where they cross over in the middle. And this is going to be for variations in human characteristics. So we're going to have a go at a couple together and I'm going to leave you to do some by yourself. So let's do eye colour first because we've looked at that. Do we think it's inherited and it comes from your parents? Do we think it's the environment or both? Does our eye colour change if we live in a different country? Or does it change if where we live doesn't have very much sunlight? No, so this is inherited. We get it from our parents. And that's what we've just looked at when we did the, what, the example before. What about if we do hair length? That's a tricky one. Do you think some of us find it easier to grow long hair because that comes from our parents? I do. I think you might be right if you say that. 
So there's not exactly a right or wrong for this one. Do you think we have different length hair? Because actually some of us decide to cut it shorter when we go to the hairdressers. Yeah. So actually this one could be in both. It's in the middle. What about then body shape? And this is an um, interesting one. So sometimes we look a little bit like our mums and dads with our body shape. Sometimes it could be to do with our height. But I've put that one as a separate one at the bottom. So what if we decide that we want to get really muscly and we're going to go to the gym? Or we want to be really good at cycling, so we're going to work on our legs a lot. Do you think our body shape would change? And that's through the environment that we're in. We're choosing to change it. So that could go in both as well. You could argue, though, you could put it in one or the other, as long as you explain it. What about uh, height? Is that something that changes because of our environment? No. What about both then? Can it be both? Nope. So it's inherited. If your parents are tall, it's likely that you'll be tall as well. If your parents are shorter, it's likely that you'll be shorter. What about skin tone? This is another tricky one. Is it something that's inherited? Yeah. So we get our skin tone from our parents. Is it something that does change, though, depending on the environment that we're in? Does it change slightly if maybe we go to a warmer country? If you go on holiday, does it change a little bit? Yeah, so you could argue that actually it's in the middle. You might want to put it just in inherited and that's okay if you want to explain it. You could say that it goes in the middle depending on the environment you're in. And then I'm gonna leave three at the bottom, clothing, foot size and hair color for you to do by yourself. But I don't mind if you move some of these around if you think that they go somewhere different and want to give us an explanation as why. So your task for today, your first one is to define what variation is. So you can pause the video and go back through it because we've mentioned it a few times. Or if you wrote an example at the start of what you thought it was, you might want to adapt it or research a little bit and add something to it. Then I'd like you to have a go at completing a Venn diagram like the one that we've just done together. So what variations in humans can be inherited and which are to do with the environment or are some of them both? Do they fit into both categories? You could explain, give us a sentence to explain why you've put some of them there if it's different to what you think other people will have put. Then I would like you to say what possible characteristics my offspring inherit. So I'm going to give you some examples like when we did the mum and the dad or the two dogs. What do you think their offspring or children will inherit? What do you think they'll look like? Can you give your own example of that? So you might want to do hair colour. If you have a, um, a mum and a dad who both have brown hair, what do you think their children are going to end up, um, what hair colour do you think their children will have? If you've got a parent with brown hair and one with blonde hair, what do you think their offspring might look like? And then finally, I'd like you to think about what two factors can lead to variation in living things. So that's something that you can go back through the video to find out because we went over that in a, the middle of today's lesson. So five jobs for you to do on your worksheet and then turn it in so me and Mrs Farrell can have a look at your answers.